Great. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm Naomi Slip, the Douglas and Cynthia Crocker and Dare Chair for the Chief Curator here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here in this room and on Zoom to this public roundtable in celebration of the recently opened exhibition, The Azorian Spirit, The Art of Domingo Shrabello. This landmark exhibition and companion publication introduce audiences to the incredible output of this renowned Azorian artist, Domingo Shrabello. This evening, we will engage three leading scholars in conversation about the seminal modernist figure in Portuguese art and culture. And I'm gonna introduce them here, um, not by order of how they seat, but uh, the first, Dr. Memory Holloway. Memory, if you'll give a little wave, <laughs> is Professor Emerita of Art Education, Art History and Media Studies at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, Dr. Holloway is an expert in European modern art history of the 20th century, has published books on Picasso and Paul Arrego, and contributed an essay to the Rebello catalog on uh, Domingo Rebello's Newfoundland murals of fishermen. I hope everyone will pick up and read. Uh, Dr. Onesimo Almeida, here on the end, is Port Professor of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies at Brown University, is the author of numerous <laughs> book-length studies of Portuguese heritage, literature, and culture, and more than 200 essays. When do you sleep, Onesimo? The recipient of numerous accolades, he received two decorations from presidents of Portugal, was elected to the Portuguese Academy of Sciences, received an honorary degree from the University of Aveiro, and most recently receives the 2022 Chairs Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Humanities from the Rhode Island Humanities Council. And our final... <laughs> Our final discussant for this roundtable is none other than George Rebello, a lifelong scholar of the work and biography of Domingos, a serious historian into Domingos's output and legacy, and as the grandson of the artist, has dedicated himself to studying and sharing the works of this important figure with audiences around the world. George Guest curated our phenomenal exhibition downstairs and has championed its execution and uh, bringing it here from the very beginning. So we're very grateful to him and to these three participants. for joining us this evening to discuss the life of Rebello, his art, and his legacy. I would also like to thank the museum staff who helped put events together like these, who are uh, on all sides of us. And our exhibition sponsors, uh, an anonymous donor, the Center for Portuguese Studies and Culture at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, the Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies at Brown University, the Luso American Development Foundation, FLAD, Massachusetts State Senator Michael J. Rodrigues and the Rodrigues Arts and Culture Fund of the South Coast Community Foundation, SATA, Azores Airlines, and TAP Air Portugal. So thank you to everyone for making this exhibition possible, and we'll get to sit down and talk about it now. Prepared questions our panelists I'll be asking in order, and then we will hopefully have about five minutes of questions from panelists so that we have time to open it up to questions all at the end. Um, so our first question, um, George, can you walk us through? I should uh, that if I... and, uh, <laughs> we are pre I did. <laughs> this isn't a this isn't a pop quiz. Folks have have seen these. So uh, George, I'm hoping that you can walk us through an abbreviated timeline of Domingo's life for our audience um, and share with them. Domingo was born. December 3 of uh, 891 in Ponta Delgada, uh, uh, Miguel Island in the Azores. The family been here in the portrait with his uh, father, mother, two elder brothers, and a younger sister. He had, um, uh, had a preparation in a school called Institute Fisher with them. Um, French missionaries, uh, so from the beginning, religion and was very present in life. One of his teachers who was not uh, religious, was a master of work, noted that at eight years old, Mingsbill already painted without any kind of orientation. And when he was 13, he had the brilliant idea to expose some of his works on a shop, center of Ponta Delgada. 
and uh, he wrote an article for a newspaper. This article probably attracted the attention of Countess of Albuquerque, Mariana Braza, as she was a painter herself, a materialist painter. He talked with her husband, they were impressed by his talent, and in a few years after that, paid for his scholarship to Paris, and at 50 years old, with part of ice yet to complete, off he went to Paris, a kid, and he studied in three major free academies. Luckily for him, he had a, a group of Portuguese painters, and him, everyone who had come from fine arts, who, um, Surrounded him, protected him, act like a family to him. He was the first group of modernist painters. Joseph de Cardoso, Lord Viana, Francis Smith, Mary Cruz. They were the main friends of the Rubel, and he was part of this first modernist group. So he had the formal education academy. But at the same time, it was, it was on the eye, the hurricane or the explosion that occurred in Paris. And he absorbed all the representation. Uh, well, all these modernist ideas, this experience, colors, are bit and he comes, his package comes in 13, 21, with Orge, but he met a lot of I do this one. All his life, he had to deal with this resistance. So, he used a trick to say, it was very subtle on his approach. He accepted, time is confirmed. Natural painter. She is not, because he doesn't try to participate either being or nature. Just made interpretation using all these techniques learn and develop. Lifetime develop an art technique unique. One of the last discoveries I've made is that Ming Jibel simulated went off being an islander. Surrounded by the sea, paintbrush relates to wave or spot water. That is unique in this kind of thing. So subtle that you have to be very near painting to see his masters. So he spent part of his life, 1942, uh, marriage once, lost his wife, Hercules. Then he married second time my grandmother, woman from Viseu, Irish continental Portugal, went with her to Azores. They have five kids. And he painted and uh, gave um, lessons, artistic lessons there in preschool and in private um, in his private studio. 1942, he goes to Lisbon because his sons wanted to study violin under and there were no schools in resorts. And he spent the last 30 years of his life in Lisbon, painting and giving classes morning, afternoon, and night, non stopping, never having vacations. Passion for painting and a, pa a passion for students. For, um, he had this thought yes, I was a privileged boy who have a unique lifetime experience that other boys would like in Portugal or in the Azores, I felt an obligation to transmit everything I know and form new generations with this detail. I won't try to mold any kind of my students. They, with each one, will develop their own styles. That's what Hey, George. Um, Onesimo, can you follow up on George's description 
by contextualizing the cultural influences on Domingos, particularly Azorian literature, theater, and poetry. Knowing George, how he talks about his grandson, listening to him doing it in four minutes, quite impressive. Oh, I had read. Yeah, I don't want to sound like an academic. Oh. George is a possible person. It was the one, Senator Michael, uh, bring the collection of his grandfather's painting here. And uh, Michael's biggest thought of the Rhode Island School of Design. Luckily, he approached us. Proposal came to the board. I, I was there. After the, then Gil Perry came in, started ball rolling. It's a long story, but this is a collective effort. Impressive. Even George now is tremendously happy with the fact that his grandfather dreamed of having paintings exhibited here in the United States, and he's how professional this is for the exhibit. The museum has a great trustee board of trustees and a great team directing it, and uh, other. So I have only two and a half minutes. I will, uh, you know, because I think that clearly stated, I, I, I would say uh, that uh, George, uh, George is always trying to make sure that we don't confuse his grandfather as a natural, meaning uh, Aristotle talked about uh, art being mimetic. We just reproduce what's uh, Great artists reproduce that. But since photography, painting, and artists have been trying to run away from photography, the, the, the camera does the job. So we have to do something. So the language of Dominguez Bell, as you witnessed here, is not the language of a natural. The problem, the, the, not the problem, but the spirit is natural. Dominguez Bell went to Paris and he got lots of avant-garde people, but Portugal was going through a turmoil. Portugal killed the king in 1908 through uh, 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 a republic was uh, imposed on, on, on the monarchy in 1910, and um, uh, Rebelo was very young. Um, that's when he ran those years. In those years, he went to Paris. Then, because of World War I, he and his friend, Porto Rodrigues, returned to Portugal. And Portugal uh, was really, uh, really going through a tough time. Um, there was a very old-fashioned conservative country. And a whole bunch of politicians who had, were totally imbued, completely imbued of these uh, 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 liberal ideas that had come from France. And the two things didn't match the ideas of the politicians and the real life of people uh, did not match. So there, was a, there were strong movements against the new regime. And um, there were people who say that, don't try to make us European because we are not you. Our sensibility is very different. And there was a movement called Nova Renascença. I'm not going to get into it, but, but that but Cabello and Couture were part of it. And when they came, when they went back to because of them, and uh, they went back to San Miguel, um, there was a friendship between this poet, Armand Couture, and the painter, Domingos Robelo. And at that time, it was people were really dissatisfied with politics. And a strong movement towards the recovery or towards supporting the real life of Portuguese that case of the Azorians, of people in some hell, trying to discover, trying to discover the soul of the I go into details, but I will spare you. But the thing is, there was a strong influence of St. Francis of Assisi. You may say, what does that have to do with this? Well, St. Francis of Assisi is, uh, started the Franciscans. The first are the first, uh, the first um, religious group that in the Middle Ages starts changing the focus of 
life in India, the world. People lived for about 30 years, and people, all they were concerned with was saving a place for themselves in heaven. So St. Francis started saying, hey, God wrote two books. One was the Bible, and the other one is nature. Look at nature and see that God is all over. They were contemplative. And this uh, jumping centuries, and there was this movement in Portugal saying, well, you are, a, liberals are against this way of life. These people are good people. These people have difficult lives, but they manage it. They survive and they do their best. They are good. And, and when Domingos Robel and the poet could turn to Sobel, they, in, though they, a language, one in poetry, and uh, uh, um, Domingos Rubel with a brush, even though the language they write about or broad is modernist, the soul that they want to capture is the soul of the people that under the influence of St. Francis, they are these good people out there that want to capture lives they are. This is why immigrants relate to that thing. They, my grandparents, my parents, were like that. Uh, that's how I was. That's how I grew up. I remember this. This is why this stronger people have a This man is a modernist who writes a modern language, but he captured the spirit of the, of the island where he lived, where he was born, was of upper middle. But he realized that there was some life of that could not be dismissed, that should be looked at, because these were really good people. Did I go over for Perfect. Thank you. Um, Memory, can you elaborate a little bit on the artistic, on Domingos's art, and contextualize him, similar movements, similar artists? Uh, I have to say that if you want to know what Mingus Fabello looked like. <laughs> it's George. And when you look at the portraits, he looks exactly like the Mingus Fabello. And I have to also tell you that I met George maybe five years ago, and I went to the house and we looked at the pictures, extraordinary. And just before I was getting ready to fly back from Lisbon, it was 11 o'clock. George came after, George came with a big book that big, full of photographs, full of articles, all sorts of things. And I said, George, this is at 12.30. I said, great, one o'clock, 1.30. George and I are still sitting there. That's George. Uh, it's been wonderful to work on this exhibition and it's been wonderful to work with George who gave such a nice, and, and also what Onesimo says about the soul of the people comes through every single picture. Downstairs, when you look, you'll see there is a beautiful drawing of St. Francis. Um, so I want to look, I think there are three periods, three periods in uh, his work. The first one, yeah, the first one is when he goes to Paris. So let's look, yes. Uh, when he goes to Paris, imagine he's 15 and he goes to a studio. This is the Academy Julienne and there are naked women modeling. So you can imagine what this is like. You can, see, you can see there at the back, a lot of these were women who came from maybe the street. Sometimes they were poor women. But this was studio practice. How will you learn to draw the body? You don't see it. There they were. The Academy Julienne also admitted women painters, and they were from everywhere. This was really something from boy, 18 years old, from Ponte Delgado, that's really something. So um, he was there with, in the same area, he, he probably lived in a studio just like this that you see on the left, uh, Rue Falguier. There were a lot of artists. You can see that the windows allow the light in. And Casa was around the corner. Matisse was around the corner. These artists, especially with Brock, Sat, they went every afternoon to the cafes, they drank brandy, they smoked cigars, they read the newspaper, and then they tore them up and made collages. That was one kind of really experimental work. Rebello was not interested in that, and what they taught in the academy 
was how to draw the There were a number of so-called religious or historical pictures, really, really solid. That's something he takes away. But at the same time, in this whole period, there are people painting this beautiful color. We're looking at 1907, 1911. That was the time in Paris. So that's the first part. That's the first studio. He went then to another studio, which is probably less expensive. And we cannot forget that this Contessa from Gerke allowed him or gave him the money to. This is what all of us need, someone to help us along, right? Especially if you're an artist. So he then goes to a second studio, which is um, another studio. And there he learns more about how solid figures. When you look at the exhibition, you see that there are two kinds of painting. Some are almost like watercolor, really this beautiful Azorian light. But there are others which are really, really solid. So that's what he learns. And he meets, he meets all these people. He meets Medigliani, who else does he meet? This was at um, a studio which is still in Paris called the Grand Chaumière, which means the big cottage. And so he met all these people, Modigliani, lots of them. And what, what Georges says, which is right, is that there was a whole group of Portuguese artists affected all of them living in a place like that studio that we saw. He knew many of them. He was right at the center of Bohemian Paris, but it wasn't exactly that kind of experimentation of tearing stuff up and making abstract. Not for him, not for him. So we'll get to um, we'll get to some of the other things that he, he traveled a lot. Went also in 1908 to Brittany, and if you know, Brittany's on the northwest coast of France. They have great preps there, and um, a lot of artists went there because there was a special kind of dress, um, lace crown that the women wore. So there are paintings of this period as well. He was at the center. He did. A lot of things other artists did, but he did it in his own way. An absolute inspiration. Thank you. Um, George, can you carry on a little bit uh, following up on what Memories talked about and describe a little bit about how the exhibition especially reveals Domingos's artistic process uh, and the importance of teaching for him? So, um... One of the things I thought it was interesting for people to see the exhibition is you imagine you are immersed on an artist's studio. And in, in that studio, going to accompany is the artist on the process. From the very first sketch, very simple, we have some of these sketches done. So the final composition very elaborate and in between it's all process that an artist make what he has to establish as the structure of the final because one of the things that you don't see on the final position is so the painting you don't see that behind the painting Hidden behind the layers are a structure, usually, of a draw, a pencil. English will either use draw, uh, a pencil, draw, or sometimes that, that was discovered in his most famous painting, The Immigrant, that is in Museu Carlos Machado. Uh, I, I found that there are at least 10 versions that period of 30 years, from 1926 to 19. 56 time and time again comes to this theme like an obsession. So in this biggest um, canvas in Musukaj Machado, uh, some years ago, three or four years ago, they cleaned, restored the painting. They did a lot of examinations. One of them was infrared examination. What did they find behind the layers? that Domingo Jubil, with a very uh, precious brush, with ink, black ink, 
put the contour of the, all the figures of the, the scenery. A very, very thin painting black. Well, this, the skeleton structure, the main structure of painting. Painting. Layer after layer. That's what. So, there is a structure, an occult structure behind. But how does a painter reach his goal? He passes through various periods of experiments. English Bill went to the country, died, started to just make a sketch, very sketch. You know what it sometimes do? Put indications of colors, because I have this sketch. Indication of colors. So he was seen. I said, serving, I'm choosing the colors, not what I see. It's his interpretation of what is not a photographic as um, an is He's not, a, a, not choosing, choose not to be um, a painter at common in Portugal at that time. Naturalist, he chose to be in the wake of the post uh, post impression, chose to travel that path. Uses the colors that they were experimenting. So, a sketch, to the colors, sometimes, sometimes, and then he goes to his studio, starts to elaborate. Otherwise, other times, like uh, old. Frame paints in a very fresh, very rapid style. You can see some of these paintings exhibition. So all this work, preparation, way to structure your mind what you want. You want to you like to be, to big composition, sometimes on human scale. Like other uh, Spanish painters that he met in Paris, like Sorolla or Zulaga, was very impressed by their talent. Uh, so, in this exhibition, you can see from the simplest sketch, final, and have an, an idea of the process. All the work that the painter he is a serious, honest work, he has to develop. English bill was never said. So, always trying, trying other things. Get nature, learn, never stop. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, Onesimo, can you build on this and talk a little bit about how Domingo's work? relates to the Azorian identity, the history of the Azores, and the involving relations with the mainland during Domingo's lifetime? Not a small question. Yes, it's not a small question. It's answer. Oh. Um, there's a huge in the Azores today, Azores back then. There's more change past 40 then, so uh, this paint fit gazors on. So it's impossible to talk about identity because people have different ideas of what identity is. But identity does not mean there's no obligation for a group of people to remain same forever. Every culture all. Every culture. Uh, the thing is that for 400 years, isolated in the middle of the ocean, Azores have not evolved very much because they were dependent. Azores were a key point during the time that the Portuguese went to India to the Far East, because on the way back, ships had to stop in India. So the Azores were central, were in contact with the coast. But then, um, that time gone, and islanders were, and they were brought there towards this strategic plan. 
ships had stopped in one island. They picked Vader because it had the best bay, protected from the prevailing south west winds. But then when that time was gone, so left there. Why? Portuguese started immigration to Brazil. Uh, they needed to populate Brazil. Big people had nothing to do. They had no reason to be there. They were brought to Brazil. So the point, so the thing is, is, is the Azores of are in, in part on. Many of them are still. They came here and they, the image of Portugal is of those, those islands that they left. So, um, so when asking about the Mingus Rubel and the Korean identity, the Mingus Rubel kept the soul of the majority of the island of Lots of similarities. There's a huge difference. And, uh, and he captured the spirit of the life in some during those hard first decade of the 20th century. So Azores changed men's, but even Azores, Orient, of to like to back in. Hey, even tell the young, have to remind you, look, this is the life of your parent. Life of your parent should be shaped back. Your parents and grandparents survived and went through all this. So, Mingus Rebel now becomes a remind how life was. Uh, oh, it, there was, I, I should mention, there was Duarte Sanchez in California in the 80s. I, 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 listened, I watched the presentation of the Bill at the College of Machado Museum. Uh, California kids, Portuguese American, teach them how life was in Portugal, times of their grandparents, pastors, and because. California, totally different lifestyle, forgot them in order to show them where they had come, friends had come from. So this is why I say that even though uh, George, in fact, that not a natural, plain writing of naturalism, the content is naturalist, capture that I love. Um, Emory, can you carry this forward and talk a little bit about the official patronage for Domingos from the government and the church during his lifetime, and in particular his mural cycles, which of course could not travel to us, fixed as they are on the wall. I mentioned that there are three I think there are three periods. The first is the Paris period, goes back to the Azores. He takes a lot of what he learns about color. Color is just wonderful. It's transparent, it's watery. What Georges describes as wave like, it's really, really beautiful. So that he learned a lot, Paris, about color. The second period is the period in which he lives in the Azores. And it's during this period. I think the work changes, but if you look at this picture on your right, also on your left, that's the Azorian period. Often refer to this as regional. He was absolutely in line with something called uh, the return to order. It takes place in France. It's a, a response to the carnage and the difficulty of World War I. And there's a huge movement in Europe, which is often not, not discussed in relation to Mingus Cobello, but he's right there. He does it in relation to studies of ethnography, studies of local people, studies of hardship that Onesimo has mentioned. Look, for example, at the, the, the stretch 
and the struggle of moving that boat and how wonderfully paints this arm. Look at the arms in this painting. Two things to look at in the exhibition. He likes the structure of holes. Why? Holes and trees, because it structures the picture. Sometimes also there's a grid beneath. How do you, how do you locate things on a, a canvas? You make a grid, put things on. And then in this one, which I think is such a beautiful painting, um, and really interesting, what is that box with all the candles in it? What is that for? And those little pointy things, those triangles. Well, I have to tell you that um, my husband's an oceanographer. And I said, what is that, Jim? He explained it. He says that this box is a light box and the triangles with the holes in it are to make sure that the heat can escape the handle there for carrying it. And so you put this on the boat so that you have light. Yeah? Ah, then you, <laughs> you put it in the water. It's bait. <laughs> it's bait. Okay. This is a real ethnographic uh, item which tells us about the practice of fishing. Really good. So the second, this is the second period. This is the Azorian period. Regionalist, just like Europeans are going back to this, back to the, the figure. Not abstract. We've had enough of that. A lot of them continue. But even Picasso is making figures that return to classical ideas. Turn to order, no more war. Third period, and most of the pictures here are from the Azorian period, rightly so. Third period is an interesting one. Rubello goes in 1942, remember that Portugal is neutral in the war. 1942, he goes back to Portugal and he is commissioned, commissioned by the art director of Salazar's government. He's always, always been interested in, in heroes. The heroic people, look at this, the heroic people of the Azores. And when he gets to Lisbon, they commission him to heroes of the descubrimentos, you know what that, the discovery. And so he goes to the National Assembly which is like our Congress. And in a long hall, the great room, he does four out of seven enormous pictures, enormous, three times the size of a person. What do they document? You know the answers. Everybody, every Azorian here knows the answers. All those Vasco da Gama, all those people who go around the Africa and who go to India, the discoveries. This is the, this is the, the history of the greatness of Portugal, and he paints it. Why did they choose him? He's really good. He knows how to paint it. And the way that he used color, different from what he used in the Azul, which was had this kind of atmospheric color that comes through the fog, no more. They're very, very stable, and the paintings flat. So that's the third period. There's one other thing that he does in 1955, this has to do with Canada and Newfoundland. There is something called the White Fleet, the Frota Branca, something like 60 ships, uh, fishing ships with dories, dories on them. And there's something like 5,000 fishermen on these ships. They go out daily, these little dories, and they line fish. Other, other countries have moved forward. Portuguese are still line fishing. And to help them, they build something called the Gilianish, which is the hospital ship. And this is wonderful. Hospital ship provides them with medical coverage, dentistry. What does Rebello do? He's commissioned to do painting on the hospital ship. There are two. First one is called Fisherman's Family. It's in, the, it's in the book, and it shows men plaid in the center, 
His wife off to the side, his little boy is learning to design ships. The hospital is behind. This is the celebration. This is the way that the Salazar government shows that it is supporting fishermen. We're the heroes of the sea. They call them Héroes de Mar, heroes of the sea. Second painting is a painting of the Virgin. Okay? Aft back part of the ship, they have a mass. Whoever will come. There's a picture of the Virgin, fisherman on one side, his wife on the other side, kneeling. This is very, very moving. I went to see the ship, which is now a museum, way in the north of Portugal, called Viana do Castelo. There's no castle there, but the ship is there. Absolutely wonderful. And I looked through all these journals called the Journal of Fishermen, Jornal de Pescador. And I think that Rubello also looked at these. And what you see are all these fishermen back at the ship aft at mass with this picture, painting of the Virgin. So extraordinarily moving. And then um, when, this is 1955, Rubello is all, all, already 64 years old, four, and he's doing this painting. And when you see the photographs, when they took the ship in to Newfoundland, to St. John's, fishermen in their plaids with their lanterns, singing Ave Maria, there's a video of this, go up the hill to St. John the Baptist, where there is still a statue of Fatima carrying it. This is just wonderful. And who did it? Who made this possible? Mingo Scobello made this possible, made this focus of Catholic belief on these fishes. Thank you so much. Um, George, can you conclude the organized part of our roundtable by talking for a moment about what it means to share your grandfather's work with audiences here on the South Coast? Uh, with this exhibition, uh, I think I was mad, <laughs> I think I was bold, because I, I tried to interpret so many decades after death this dream of my grandfather. My feeling is that he wanted to breathe, to br uh, build a bridge between both sides of the Atlantic, between Portugal, and especially his Azorian beloved Azorian islands, and people who came here at a life risk, not knowing what they will expect this new world, bringing their families. Yeah, the tremendous admiration for these people. So, when in 1922, 1923, he strived to organize this exhibition, he wanted to pay homage to you who are here, sitting. You, Ernest, everybody in this room. He had this feeling, this admiration. couldn't arrange the means. I have this idea that when he painted immigrants was of his frustration, his limit that circumstances imposed on him, he said, well, I can't reach physically the immigrants. From my little studio, I'm going to paint my most felt admiration with all my heart I'm going to paint immigrants in their memory and is their homage. I'm here in Loco Parentes. I'm just here representing my grandfather, trying to interpret his dream to pay homage to you all. That's it.
Those of you who would like to have a grandson like George, raise your hand. Wonderful. Um, it's a, obviously a privilege and a pleasure to have the exhibition here and to, to share with everyone. Of course, one man and two of us. Naomi is here, Emma Rocha, Amanda, all the staff. Onesim, he pulled all the strings that could imagine for all the bloody Portuguese bureaucracy. Damn day. And all the people, like memory, who contribute for this book, all the other authors, I'm grateful to them all. I myself from Lisbon, <laughs> I just made little steps, but it is a teamwork, of course, a tremendous effort of teamwork, and I'm very thankful. Everybody, every contributors, Michael Rodriguez, of course, who had this idea. So everybody fight for this exhibition. So it is our exhibition. So we've reached the point where we can open it up to all of you. Questions from our audience here in the room and on the Zoom. Um, I will hold the mic out to you. Does anyone have anything? There will be a few. This is the pop quiz part. <laughs> Unprepared. I'm going to put your hand up. I think we'll bring a mic for anyone. Very good. Okay. John Vasconcelos. Um, one thing that's really interesting about Portuguese art in, on the mainland and also in San Miguel is there has always been interest figure. It goes back to the 15th century and it's consistent. And so if you go to Gulbenkian, for example, which has such a great collection, in general, not always, you see the figure moving through. Think of Paul Arrego is in a way an heir to this whole idea of the solidity of the figure, being able to draw the figure, being able to draw. There's another side, and that is, and I worked on somebody called um, Yao, who was a filmmaker, absolutely abstract. It's the, it's the other side. And that's, to some extent, the way in which Portuguese art has become international there continues to be an interest in the figure. So that is linked back, of course, to Rubello. I don't know what they think. I, I, that would require some interviews. I don't know what they think specifically, but I know that a lot of the artists continue to make figurative work, which suggests that there is this continuity. We say that Ming's bill there is still some memory, like it's still present in, in the Azores. Although a lot of people only think of him referring to the immigrants. I had a friend of mine from a port once studying her thesis, and she started to ask people from the Delgada, oh, do you know Mingsville? Everybody knew about Mingsville. So can you tell me about his paintings? What paintings do you have in mind? Oh, the immigrants. And then, Immigrants, and then, and then. <laughs> so, it's a very um, unique case of an artist created with a with a paint, which is very good. It's very limit. It has a very limit for his artist because imagine man constructing a uh, 
body of art I cut about 5,000 pieces. It's huge, six years. But if you go to Lisbon and you ask people about Domingos Bill, Domingos who? They don't know. His art, art is in um, museums, but most of it is not on the public view. So I'm also, it's my fight to try to awake people and uh, make them discover either in the Azores, Lisboa, or continental Portugal, that there is this artist. And, and, and it is a great artist, and it, people can discover something that is unique. I'll add just, just a few things. Uh, going to the National Assembly in Portugal uh, and seeing huge painting by Domingos Rubel, nobody knows the author. Um, I went once going to Vila Vistosa Palace, where Portuguese go and spend the summer, and I was walking by the corridor painting. I recognized the artist, that's Domingos Rubel, and nobody. English Bill was, uh, but also one day I was having lunch at the Belém Palace, Presidential Palace. There was a huge painting at the catalog. Uh, and uh, I said, that's the English Bill. Nobody there knew. But so, but, but that's, these are three little facts. But then when we talk about um, immigration to the United States, we say that usually the first generation rejects parents but it's the grandchildren that want to reconnect. You have to think of the Azores and of Portugal uh, in the same terms. Uh, the, the new generation has, it, uh, has come out of this sort of life where there's poverty, uh, life was difficult, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So they want, they are, they've been insularized, they've been, they've been portrayed as old fashioned, uh, conservative, uh, uh, primitive, mm, Sometimes that was the adjective. Uh, and they want to run away from it. This is happening also. You have Portuguese writers going to North Korea, going to Iceland, and going everywhere looking for subjects to run away from the same old. So this is happening. But I'm convinced that the next generation is going to look back at this, say, this is gone, we have lost something, there's something here very important that is part of us that we must recover, and we must be feel comfortable talking about it, looking at it as part of it. So uh, I, I think that this comparison between what happens with American immigrants, the immigrants is something that the audience should play to. In the catalog, there is a really nice essay written by Jose Maria de França Machado. And this is the last thing that he says. It's exactly a, a, a response. And I've re, rewritten it. It's urgent to rescue the Ming Shpobello from island confinement. To praise what he did best, because it's really good. It's natural for the islanders, the Azorians, to claim him as theirs, but one must understand that he is universal in precisely what he did while walking the islands. Great. He was a realist among realists across Europe, but there is more. He was born in these islands. From them, he must be rescued. He must be discovered. He is still waiting for the place he deserves. And I think that's an answer to your question, and also what Onesimo is saying. A question from the audience? Mm -hmm. I'm going to just repeat that for the Zoom audience. So the question is, is and I'm going to 
summarize here. Um, at what age did George become aware of his grandfather and the legacy and, and seek to take on this work? Well, you know, I knew my grandfather till the age of eight. Ingersoll was a very reserved and silent man, but he was very observing and caring. Memory I have of him in my childhood was a very caring, always looking for me, my brother, my sister. When I was about 20 years old, and there were some Azorians that knock on our door, the painter Urban Rezenc, uh, his friend Carlos Lacerda, they were representing uh, Galeria Arcoit, and they wanted to make an exhibition of Domingo Jubil in his last house in Azores, uh, Paterra. And they asked my father, my, my father opened the doors, and luckily, the, uh, the family heritage was still in our house, the whole heritage for the divide, div, division. So they were able to pick up whatever, whatever they, they, they wanted. And I was with them, and I was a companion, and I said, well, we have all these paintings, all these things, and I was not aware. <laughs> so after they left and they made the ex exhibition, I started to take photographs in a very Sportive. Well, just taking pictures. And then I started to look at the painting, the drawings. Well, wait a minute, there is something here. And then I started to collect, no, to, to go what my father and my grandmother had, big newspaper articles, letters. I said, well, that's interesting. There is a story here and here and here and here. For the last 30 years, this has been my, my passion to discover. And um, I'm trying to pass to the next generation this legacy and this enthusiasm for art. Wonderful. Thank you, George. And I should say you are, of course, all over and in this exhibition, but you are actually in this exhibition as well, in a family photograph in one of the cases sitting at your grandparents' feet. <laughs> so. Um, Testament there. Some people think George just walked out of the painting. Wonderful. Um, well, I think we've we've reached the end of our scheduled time here. Um, this has uh, been a pleasure. I know. I hope everyone has enjoyed it. Please join me in thanking our participants here for for speaking with us. Thank you all.